Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this afternoon's webinar. My name is Hannington Amol, the Chief Executive Officer of the East African Law Society. Uh, to kick us off, the President of the East African Law Society, Willie Rubea, will be delivering the welcoming remarks. Welcome, Willie. Thank you, uh, Huntington. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We take this opportunity to welcome you to the continuing series of training at the East African, at the East African Law Society. The webinar today is the continuation of what we started last week and we carry on until the end of this month and even further. We have planned two more sessions and there will be updates so soon. The Governing Council of the East African Law Society has sent its greetings. As you know, East African Law Society consists of seven bar associations, Burundi Bar Association, Rwanda Bar Association, South Sudan Bar Association, Zanzibar Law Society, Tanganyika Law Society, Uganda Law Society, and the Law, and the Law Society of Kenya. All these seven bar associations work together to deliver the dream of the East African community, rule of law, good governance, and development of a united and vibrant legal profession. We see our effort through these training opportunities as building blocks to a global, globally competitive legal profession in East Africa. Our efforts are greatly complemented by goodwill of our partners globally. Among our partners, the Attorney's General Alliance Africa stands tall. I really appreciate the efforts by the team led by Marcus Green in ensuring that we, sp we spread out, out understanding of complex legal skills among our members. Today, we are speaking around data protection. Rising data as an important subject in commercial activities has also brought many other challenges and opportunities. Governments have lately been making attempts to gather as much data as possible about their citizens, while businesses try to gather as much as possible about their consumers. Data presents an opportunity for lawyers to rethink the traditional data protection mode. While, the, while previously data was mainly physical, and could be retrieved manually, destroyed and stored in a cabinet. Today's data exists in cloud computing. A little breach of data storage and trade and professional secrets are spilled to the entire world. You may recall the uh, WikiLeaks, the Panama Papers, and the GAPTA scandals all brought to fore because of breaches of computer storage data, stored data. Our team of dedicated and highly experienced speakers will be unpacking the place of, of lawyers when it comes to data protection. Uh, ultimately, your role is to learn how, to come, to can, uh, how you can protect yourself, your client's interests, and how you can make business sense out of the rising data protection regimes. May I? May I not forget to thank you for finding time to be with us, even when times look, look difficult. I am aware that our members do not have the luxuries of traveling, attending to the, their work, or even getting businesses due to the constraints brought up about by COVID-19 pandemic. East African Law Society understands your plea and it's for this reason that we try to deliver this free training opportunity to enable you to build your skills and be ready to exploit emerging opportunities. I now take this opportunity to invite our guests and even sponsor Norman Thierry representing AGA to do the opening. Norman is a uh, I as a member of AGN has always been our also our guest wherever we invite her as ELS. Welcome, Norman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rubea. And I indeed also echo your set sentiments about data crime and security. 
data security has been on the rise, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. As early as this morning, I received an SMS asking me to replace my bank card. Shortly after that, I received an SMS telling me to ignore the previous SMS. This was clearly a scam. The core reason we gather here today is to exchange knowledge. Knowledge on how to better combat data criminals. We must get ahead of the game. As we all know, at the core of our values as AGA Africa and EALS, we value the exchange of knowledge. We have done this brilliantly over the years. Last week, we held a webinar on advocacy tips in, and techniques in virtual course. Facilitators, AGA Africa reps and EALS participants, welcome. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you more about AGA Africa and what our goals are. As AGA Africa, we train investigators, prosecutors, judges, magistrates, and other law enforcement officers on the investigation and prosecution of transnational crimes. We also participate in seminars and other events. We educate, increase public awareness, and draw attention to the dangers of transnational crimes. We are proud to continue this practice online with webinars like this one. Our footprint is in eight African countries, namely Ghana, Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria, Rwanda, South Africa, Uganda, and Zambia. The conversation does not end here. Let us keep engaging, keep talking, and keep finding solutions. You can follow us. Our social media handle is at AGA Africa. Once again, our social media handle is at AGA Africa. Welcome, thank you, and over to our moderator. Thank you so much, uh, Willie and Noma, for the welcome and opening remarks. My name is Aisha Sinda. I'm a senior associate at Pullman's Tanzania and your webinar moderator for today. Well, our topic for discussion today will focus on data protection, laws, regulations, and emerging issues. The importance of the subject is of paramount uh, because privacy and data protection has gained unprecedented attention in recent years and specifically now with ongoing COVID-19 pandemic requiring better and more elaborate rules of protection. Individuals are sometimes exposed to possible abuse and even to harmful consequences as a result of the development in ICT and the role it plays in the collection of personal information and the tendency of companies and business enterprise to collect and use personal information in making business decisions. It is therefore not surprising that many countries uh, in the West have enacted comprehensive legislation on data protection some time ago, and Europe in particular, through the recently passed General Data Protection Regulation in 2016, is heading towards the harmonization of data protection laws in order to have consistency within the region. In East Africa, countries have only just awoken to that need and are heading in the same direction. Uganda and Kenya already have privacy and data protection legislation. Tanzania does not yet have a specific law, and there are reports that the government is drafting a bill to be tabled before the parliament for discussion, but it is not yet clear when it will be published. As such, to understand the topic and examine the impact of the EU general data protection regulations, its cross-border application beyond the EU, data protection and privacy in East Africa and some of the emerging concerns, we have divided our topic for today in four sessions as follows. Session one, we'll have the introduction to data protection principles of data protection. Session two, the restriction of data protection status and comparative analysis. And session three, we'll have the opportunities for lawyers and corporations in data protection. And session four, 
we'll have cyber security and data safety. Each session will be for 15 minutes. And after the end of all sessions, we'll have a Q&A session for 30 minutes. So our participants, you will share your questions on the service questions feature on your dashboard. And this will be answered by the presenters at the end of all sessions. Now, let me welcome our first presenter, Dr. Isaac Rutenberg, to take us through introduction to data protection principles of data protection. Dr. Rutenberg is a senior lecturer and is also the, the director of the Center for Intellectual Property and Information Technology Law at Strathmore Law School in Nairobi, Kenya. He is also an associate member of the Center for Law, Technology and Society at the University of Ottawa. Dr. Rutenberg teaches and researches various aspects of IT law, including data protection and information controls, e-commerce, e-evidence, and the interface between IT law and intellectual property law. Please welcome Dr. Isaac. Thank you. Uh, can you confirm that you can see my screen and hear my voice? Yes, we can hear you and we can see your screen. Very good. I'm going to jump right in then. Uh, thank you all to the organizers and welcome to all of the to the uh, uh, participants. I'm very happy to be speaking on a topic that is uh, of growing importance, as you've already heard. Uh, in fact, just this morning, I looked at the Business Daily. I'm in Nairobi and the Business Daily here. We uh, had a report of a, a ride sharing app that uh, is owned by an Egyptian company and lost and operates in Kenya and op lost an awful lot of, of data. So these sorts of reports are becoming more and more common. And uh, we can now talk about a legal framework for address addressing such issues. So without further ado, uh, this this uh, presentation is about the basics, and I will take 15 minutes. Data protection has uh, been, rightly or wrongly, has been uh, couched in a very good versus evil or right versus wrong, uh, them versus uh, us versus them sort of a of, of a uh, framework, and there are very very strong voices on both sides. It's essentially uh, a battle, if you will, between privacy and um, security. So uh, well, security from a government perspective and from a corporate perspective, it's more about uh, financial gain. So uh, you'll see Michael Eisner here, former Disney CEO, says uh, privacy is a big impl Im impediment, whereas Edward Snowden, our, our favorite whistleblower, uh, says that privacy is critical. So the foundation of most data protection laws that are coming online around the world, uh, many of them, at least uh, the ones in, in uh, Africa are based somewhat, if not entirely, but somewhat on GDPR. G GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation from Europe. And um, although it on it's only two years old, um, it does seem to be becoming somewhat of a global standard. The uh, alternative is the US model, which is um, quite different, but I won't get into those differences. Uh, the Data Protection Act in Kenya was definitely modeled after it. It was not cut and paste, but there, were, there are many similarities. Uh, it is also quite... Uh, uh, the fines for the GDPR violations can be, can be quite dramatic. Well, they can be as small as 118 euros and as large as, uh, as 204 million. So um, let's talk about the most important thing to think about data protection is that it shifts the, the, the rights from the people who have the data to the people who are giving the data, or at least that's the idea. Data protection laws are intended to give rights to those of us who uh, are data subjects. What are those rights? Uh, well, before we get to the rights, let's talk about what is that data, sorry. The uh, personal data itself is anything that identifies you or can be used to identify you. 
Uh, and a lot of this is pretty straightforward. So your national ID is obviously uh, that, uh, but other IDs that you carry around, your phone number especially, uh, national health care uh, identities, et cetera, social security, that sort of thing. Uh, sometimes certain factors might be identifying you. So if you say the person at Strathmore University who is uh, uh, six foot five uh, or almost, almost 200 centimeters tall uh, and has a long ponytail, that, you know, that is an identifying factor that you would almost certainly be able to uh, trace back to me, for example. Uh, your online activities identify you as well, your social media identities, uh, your shopping history, uh, uh, those are of great, of great interest to corporations. Uh, daily activities, financial activities are also of great interest, and these others I've shown here. So those principles, now getting to the principles. The first, there are eight of them that I'm going to show, and these eight um, come out of the UK Act, which then sort of gave rise to the GDPR, which then has been giving rise to others. Depending on how you parse that out these different principles, there are somewhere between six and ten. Um, but I'll show you eight of them, and I'll run through these fairly quickly uh, in the interest of time. So uh, the first one is that it needs to be data. The personal data, if it is processed, and by processed I mean it is collected or then further analyzed or, uh, or processing includes a, a variety of different anal analyzing functions and, and particularly collection in the first place. So it must be done fairly and lawfully, meaning within all of the relevant laws uh, that might apply. And I think that's pretty straightforward. Uh, personal data should be obtained for one, only one or more specified unlawful purposes. And if and whatever that purpose is needs to be uh, told to, to the uh, person from which you're collecting the data, and you cannot process it in any manner beyond that purpose. So this is called the purpose limitation. You collect data for a purpose, you tell the data, data subject what the purpose is, and you don't go beyond that purpose unless you go and get further cons uh, consent from the, the data subject. Personal data should be adequate, relevant, and not excessive. I'm going to give some examples of each of these, but we're going to run through them first and then come back and discuss which of the data principles apply. Not excessive, meaning you don't need to collect more than, you should not collect more than you need. Uh, get what you need, get what's relevant, but don't get any more. Uh, it should be accurate, of course, and kept up to date. So it is on, it is incumbent on the data protection collect, the per, sorry, the data collector, the processor, uh, to keep data up to date and uh, accurate, collected accurately. Principle number five, you should make sure that this, the data is secure, essentially that you take uh, steps to make sure that uh, it is not lost, stolen, damaged, uh, or, or otherwise uh, used on, in an unauthorized manner. Uh, principle number six, you cannot transfer it. I, again, I took this out of the UK, but you can you can put that uh, European Economic Area out in. You can substitute whatever the jurisdiction is. Should be not trans. It should not be transferred outside of the area unless the uh, territory where it is being transferred to has the same level or better of data protection. And the last two, personal data process for any purpose or purposes should not be kept longer than yet needed. Once you're done with the purpose you collected it for you must delete the data. And that includes backups and any other uh, uh, manifestations of the data. And uh, the eighth one in this case is that it should be uh, collected in accordance with this act. So uh, those are the principles. And then along with those principles, every data subject, remember a data subject is me and you, uh, the data subjects have rights. We have the right to be informed, uh, to be able to access the data, to object to any processing that we don't appreciate, that we don't like, to correct uh, false or misleading data, and to delete false or misleading data. These are these particular data subject rights were taken from the Kenyan Act, but they are fairly standard in, in, in most data protection acts. All right, some scenarios. So I want you to consider which data protection principle 
would apply as, as we go through these. And in the interest of time, I won't take too long. I probably won't go through all of them as well, but just think about these as we go through. So at, um, many of us are familiar with giving uh, our data, at building entrances. Oftentimes they ask for names, ID numbers, phone numbers, sometimes employers, sometimes your vehicle registration number. And now I'm t uh, I've, I've heard fingerprints and photos. Obviously, I hope you see that these, the, the building uh, manager has an interest in collecting data to the point of knowing who is coming in and out of the building. But any one of these identity numbers or, or identifying features will do that. And so a building operator really ought not to collect any more than one of these, any more than that, and they are violating the principle of data minimization. Going on at the airport, uh, my favorite example, at the airport an immigration officer stops me from departing because of a, a red flag is raised for unpaid taxes when they scan my passport. This is uh, the purpose you have to think about. Why is the immigration person collecting my passport uh, data? And the reason for that is they have the obligation to know who is coming in and out of the country. But that obligation is very limited. It does not extend into uh, enforcement of unpaid taxes. And therefore, for them to enforce uh, uh, or to stop me from leaving the country because of my, an unpaid tax obligation is a clear violation of the lim purpose limitation uh, that we discussed in, in the principles. Uh, I particularly like the, the fourth one here. The African Loan app is now crawling the internet. Um, I've, this is a made up app. It craw crawls the internet, checking all of my public social media posts and then using an AI to automatically decide whether I am approved for a loan or if I, or if I have been rejected. Um, you can um, probably decide on your own if this is legal or not under a data protection principle. Uh, well, legal or not meaning does it violate any of the principles? Uh, that would be uh, 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 something that we can have a debate over. All right, I'm going to move on a little bit in the interest of time. Uh, there, is, there are a few more scenarios coming up, but first let's do a few other uh, topics. Stronger protection is required for children. Uh, in most cases, because uh, they don't have the option, uh, they don't have the legal ability to decide these things for themselves. So you have to get parental permission in most cases. And then even stronger protection for personal data. I'm sorry, sensitive personal data. What is sensitive personal data? Uh, that varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. The list I have here is from Kenya. It is mostly the same as GDPR, um, but there are some interesting differences. It is basically anything that talks about uh, uh, your health status or your race or racial eth uh, or, race or ethnic origin. Uh, it covers uh, beliefs and religious, uh, uh, religious positions. Uh, it, in this case, it covers marital status. Property details is one that's very unique to Kenya. Uh, the family members, uh, your sexual orientation, these are sensitive pieces of data about you, and therefore the the um, uh, the requirements of how you, how this data is treated are are even more stringent. So a few more scenarios: if an employee asks to take a sick day, and that employer happens to have all of your GPS data or access to your GPS data from the phone company, maybe they are the phone company, or maybe they. Uh, at least have access to uh, an ability to get uh, your phone data, would it be a violation of the company to find out that you didn't actually go to the doctor when you were on your sick day, but you went to the beach or you went to a clinic uh, that maybe specializes in abortions, for example? Uh, these sorts of uh, intrusions on your privacy are probably, hopefully, violating one or more of the, of the principles. Or you might ask, can the employer ask for telecom data to find out if you indeed went to a doctor and not to the beach for that day? Probably that would be a violation as well. Uh, 
in a marriage, sorry, in a, in, in a uh, job interview, perhaps the employer has asked whether uh, the potential employee is married or not. Well, that's uh, one of the sensitive personal data. It is under sensitive personal data, your marital status, and they must have a very good reason for asking that. And uh, of course, um, the, sens the sensitive data uh, provisions will apply to that. Okay, we're gonna move on a little bit here. One of the requirements of data protection laws throughout, throughout the world now is what's called a data protection impact assessment. This is uh, something that's relatively new, but we're very familiar with the concept. You can consider it something like an environmental impact assessment, where you go and uh, look at a project and what sort of environmental impact that project will have. Well, here you're looking at what sort of impact on data protection will this particular uh, activity that I'm planning, what sort of impact will it have? So if you're going to go and collect the citizenry data, the data of all of the citizens of a country, uh, for whatever reason, you're sure as, sure as heck gonna need an impact assessment and that impact assessment will look at the different ways that the data will be collected and used and, and uh, protected, uh, et cetera. Uh, even to individual companies that have uh, activities of, that involve collecting data, particularly where some of that data is uh, sensitive personal data, you are most likely going to need to do uh, impact assessment. That impact assessment would then, um, depending on the law, would, would be uh, submitted to perhaps a data protection authority for approval. Some exceptions. For the most part, there is one big way of getting an exception. No data should be processed unless, which means don't collect any data unless you have an exception. And the biggest conception, sorry, the biggest exception is consent. So if you have the consent of the person you're collecting data from, for the most part, you can do, you can collect, you can process to the uh, extent that you have gained that consent. But even without consent, there are some other, uh, almost always other ways of getting um, the ability, the legal ability, the authority to collect and process data. Usually those are those have to do with legal obligations or uh, perhaps um, uh, government activities. When you enter a building, you are essentially giving uh, consent when you give data although the data that you're giving, you are giving your consent for the purpose of entering the building and nothing more usual. Consent is actually quite difficult uh, as a topic. And I believe many of the fights that we're going to see in courts uh, around data protection will, will be around consent, uh, issues of consent and whether consent really was obtained. So the uh, definition of consent in the Kenya Data Protection Act is that it is express, it is unequivocal, it is free, it is specific, and it is informed. That Those are five requirements. And I would venture to guess that a lot of times we don't actually, we don't have all, all of those, if not even, if sometimes not even any of those. Some examples on consent, uh, we are very familiar with uh, sort of use it or, uh, sorry, um, cons consent requirements that say, if you don't accept our terms and conditions, you can't use the product. Uh, if you don't click accept, and of course you're not given an option to modify, you can't go and say, I don't like this, I don't like that term and that condition. Uh, if you don't accept these terms and conditions as they are, then you are not going to be allowed to use our product. Uh, that is arguably not true consent, right? Uh, particularly when, no, I can accept it, it may be for certain things, but particularly for, for products that are, um, that are absolutely necessary uh, or, or, or very, very important to a society. I don't know if Facebook qualifies as that, but certainly, uh, for example, your power company sending you an SMS and saying you can only consent by, say, by uh, agreeing to our terms and conditions in full, Otherwise, we will stop. We will turn off your power. Uh, that is not a true consent, in my opinion. 
Okay, almost finished. Uh, a few last things. Uh, one of the most important aspects of a Data Protection Act or law ought to be, and there is this in fact in Kenya, uh, or disclosure of a data breach. If you have lost data, you must inform not just the people whose data uh, you've lost, but the data subject, but also the, the data authority, the commissioner or, or whatever data authority is in place. You must, you must do this. And this is incredibly important because it allows us to know what sort of data breaches have been occurring. The sort of thing I read about this morning in the Business Daily, uh, I'm sure we will be hearing a lot more about things like that as the law becomes more uh, impact, uh, implemented. Uh, I believe almost lastly, uh, registration of data processors. So people who collect data and data controllers, people who manage data must be registered with a data commissioner or with some sort of data authority. Uh, typically there is a minimum threshold and above which you do need to register. Although in theory, it could be for everyone. And also uh, there's uh, a requirement in Europe, but not in Kenya for a data protection officer. Um, large public companies or, or large companies that are involved in data collection and data processing do not need a data protection officer under the law, but it is a good, a good uh, idea to have one. And lastly, uh, back to my fundamental question, good versus evil. Uh, you hear this very often. If you have nothing to hide, then you have nothing to fear. Uh, or, or just simply put, what have you got to hide? Uh, this obviously misses the point. This this uh, misses the point of privacy entirely. So, um, balancing that privacy with data protection and and access to uh, uh, access to information though is not at all straightforward. Um, just uh, if you want more information, I will. Uh, you can get a free a, a copy of this book, which was published last year. It's available at our our website at CIPIT's website, uh, which the website address is here and I will uh, turn it back to the moderator. Thank you very much, Dr. Isaac, for a wonderful presentation. As explained earlier, uh, we'll take questions at the end of all the sessions. So if you have any question, you can send them through to the questions portal and we will ask our presenters later. Now we are moving to our second uh, session, which is on jurisdictional data protection, status and comparative analysis. I would like to welcome our second speaker, Linda Bonio. Uh, Linda is the founder of the Lawyers Hub, a Pan-African community of lawyers working to employ technology to easy access to justice for tech startups, improve digital skills for lawyers, and offer policy alternatives within the tech policy arena to African governments. In 2017, Linda founded the Lawyers Innovation Hub in Nairobi, the first legal tech hub in Africa to support tech startups and cross-disciplinary collaborations in law and tech. Please welcome Linda. Um, thank you very much, and um, thanks, um, Rattenberg, for uh, the able presentation. I think it was really good and laid a good basis for, for discussion. Um, and so my presentation is going to be a little bit more about um, just discussing and comparing and seeing what are the trends within um, the data protection you know, um, arena. And so um, I just wanted to give you a map of Africa on uh, what, you know, how it looks like. On, on data protection. Um, we have different countries that you know, have come up with data protection rules um, and laws. Uh, we have some that have implemented them, um, but then we also have um, different you know, countries that actually you know, haven't brought this into the existence. If you know what happens in Africa, mostly um, you know, governments are political. And sometimes we make even data protection laws and any other laws a political process. Um, that may be brought together just for either as a donor requirement, um, a business requirement. If some of you are familiar with what's happening now between um, Kenya and USA, uh, where we have this free trade agreement um, that's currently being discussed, 
And so what's falling in between is intellectual property. And so Kenya has to um, you know, amend its intellectual property laws to ensure that it can trade with, with the US. And so this particular you know, political, you know, especially ge geopolitics, um, greatly affects data protection. Um, and so sometimes uh, somebody or a country is not able to, a country is not able to get funding if they do not have these data protection rules in in place, um, and mostly this is government to government, you know, discussions, um, and so that's the same um, sort of way in Africa. If you see uh, the yellow um, dots, we have places where the data protection law have not been enforced. The green, we have places where it's been enforced, and for red, is no data protection law at all. Um, if our neighbours in Tanzania, for example, this was mentioned by the moderator in the beginning, uh, Tanzania has no. Um, data protection laws in itself, uh, but borrows um, some of the penal provisions from the penal code. Um, one of the countries that we, you know, is considered very progressive um, in Africa around data protection is Mauritius, um, and then also we have Ghana. They were really early in the game, and so um, even in hiring for the big tech companies, most of the time they would go for these two particular countries that have some really good, um, you know, experience and semblance of uh, data protection laws. Um, and so if you're a law firm, for example, and you're working across the continent, it will be important to, you know, to compare which country this is. Um, because in our experience, um, at the Lawyers Hub, we have people consultants, especially from Europe, who are deploying um, either staff or setting up a company in Africa. And so are looking for opportunities to localize um, you know, GDPR and seeing that do, does your country have this? Do we run policies within the organization that will actually not be in conflict with the local law, but also will be in compliance with GDPR? Um, and so I think that is a really great opportunity for you know, lawyers in practice to um, keep thinking around, can we localize these international laws that you know, Prof, um, Dr. Rutenberg has just talked about um, on, on all these principles that, that we've learned about just a few minutes ago. Um, and so it's important to know that. Um, I'm just going to go to the next slide, um, and this will be um, sort of a summary um, on the different countries in East Africa and um, how this looks like. Uh, and this is basically a summary of, uh, of the earlier presentation. Uh, if you're looking at data protection laws, um, it's important to first look that, um, at one, is there a comprehensive data protection law? Um, or maybe uh, uh, does it only, uh, is only, is data protection law only represented within the constitution? It's important that we have, you know, um, standing acts within within the law where you're able to establish different things that would not be established within, within the constitutional provision. Um, so Kenya has the Data Protection Act, which was covered in, um, uh, came into effect in November 2019. Uh, the Lawyers Hub were very, um, were part of this particular process and made uh, submissions to Senate on the same. Um, and so we got some, some of the things we were asking for, some of our asks were actually not given. And I think that's, you know, true of lawmaking where you have different, um, you know, stakeholders um, and interest groups. Um, you know, um, asking for different things from parliamentarians. And so we also had civil society really engage. And so I think from the practitioner's view and the civil society view, the needs are a little bit different. Uh, but the, thankfully, Kenya now has a data protection law. Um, just this week, um, I think there was an announcement, uh, a vacancy announcement for the data protection uh, commissioner, which was um, Adver done, advertised, and then shortlisted. However, yesterday uh, we have a matter filed in court um, by a, an individual thing called Kimotho asking that um, that same process be halted until um, due procedure is followed. Um, and so Kenya will take a little bit more time in getting its data protection um, commissioner, uh, which you know was supposed to kickstart a lot of the processes and compliance. Um, we also have Uganda, which has had a Data Protection and Privacy Act, and my colleague uh, Ken, Ken uh, will talk about this maybe a little bit more um, on what's happening in Uganda. Uh, we all know that if Kenya sneezes, Uganda catches a cold, and so they keep uh, picking any law that we are trying to come up with. So thanks, Ken, for helping us. Um, we have Tanzania that we spoke about. Um, we have the constitutional provision as well as the Cyber Crimes Act, um, which um, in my opinion, Cyber Crimes Act does not adequately you know, provide for data protection because the principles you know, are set out just before my presentation um, are really different and it's not okay to criminalize an entire process. You know, um, then we have Rwanda. Rwanda has just recently republished its uh, data protection and privacy bill, 
Um, and then we also we have Burundi, and I hope Mr. President will be able to follow this through with uh, the government of Burundi to have a data protection law. Um, and so personal data, as was described before, um, in Kenya, we have personal and sensitive data really well defined and separated. And that is the same case with Uganda. In Tanzania, this is not defined. Um, and in Rwanda, um, the bill clearly defines this, this particular, um, you know, distinction it's important to describe between personal and sensitive data so that people know exactly what's sensitive what they can do with sensitive data um and i think this was also brought up before um that the difference in data is just not a standalone data for example if you went into a public um you know or you logged into your email um if you asked what's your mother's middle name it means that that's a second layer of information you need maybe you gave your email already if they ask for your mother's middle name and maybe somebody else has your national identity number. That combination is the problem um, because with that, we are able to sort of look at all these data points that you're giving us, and then somebody is able to get even more information on hacking to um, you know, um, your system. And so uh, that distinction is important in, having, in coming up with um, legislation. And then also in collecting and processing of data. Um, as we are told before, um, being a data controller, a data subject, um, and a third party, uh, we must know who is collecting this data. Are they collecting it on behalf of somebody or on their, on their own accord? Um, and I'll give you maybe an example for us to run through on, let's say, Kenya Airways. Um, if Kenya Airways, for example, involves a social media person, a social media influencer to market the airline and you know sell their tickets. So this person will be selling tickets on behalf of Kenya Airways, but ideally, Kenya Airways is the controller. They would control, you know, what sort of data, how what they do with data. And if they want to, you know, um, they want to fire this person, it's, maybe it's KLM, and KLM is operating out of, you know, in Netherlands, but they still have people that are working in Africa with data that, you know, may concern Europeans. So they cannot come and say, you know what, we we are just, this is just part of our process. They are the controllers, they're the ones who will appoint the third party. Um, and so every data law should you, you know let us know about what's the collection and how do you process it um and then for kenya that's adequately regulated as well as uganda um for tanzania it's um the consumer regulations uh, uh, partially provide for that in rwanda the bill adequately provides for that as well um and in burundi simply states that data handlers need to process information confidential um and then now we go to registration and enforcement um, and this is where, if you're in civil society, um, you will see maybe the problem with um, just having laws that do not actually, you know, are not easily enforceable. So you will have, for example, Kenya is hailed as having a data protection law. Um, but how are you able to enforce this law without a data protection commissioner? Um, and most of the time, this data protection commissioner is appointed through a political process. And so you have you know politics within this and therefore they're not distinct um from from the government of the day um and so we have kenya has set up a data protection commissioner it's uh, there's a mandatory registration um and then we also have people to, you can appoint a data protection officer um this is not mandatory um and i th think this was mentioned before that in in the eu this is it's mandatory to have a data protection officer um and uh, i think recently there's a ruling out of the eu that indicated um, that there needs to be a distinction on the roles of the data protection officer um, that should also not still be, I think, a, a, a legal person. They sort of try to, to distinguish these two roles um, so that the data protection officer would actually have some sort of independence um, from, from the organization. In Uganda, we have the Independent Personal Data Protection Office and also the requirement for um, appointment of DPOs. Tanzania is still not regulated. Um, Rwanda, the bill proposes registration and requirement for a data protection commissioner um, as, as well as the DP authority, the data protection authority. Um, we know uh, the independence of a data protection officer is basically a budgetary issue um, because if you do not have a, a data protection officer, um, data protection commissioner that is actually not, you know, has to rely on either parliament or the executive. Um, to get this budget to run its, you know, um, its own, its own office and and staff, then there is no sort of independence in this particular case. So we hope that, um, you know, uh, our next sort of, um, you know, constitutional making process that will be able to really distinguish um, and bring in this particular independence around data protection because data, as they say, is is the new oil. Um, companies now no longer 
um, compete on maybe staff. It's simply who has what data and what data can, can tell you about. I was reading recently around uh, something called digital listening, um, where organizations um, simply uh, have software or employ people to be online and do digital listening. And so they figure out what people are saying, what they want. And there's a particular case in Brazil um, where the president actually went to, he went to a massage, he went to a, a tattoo parlor um, and took pictures like he's, he's preparing to take a tattoo, um, to have a tattoo on, on him. Uh, but he actually was not going, he didn't want a tattoo, he didn't like tattoos. But every um, teenager who was on TikTok was actually ask, um, uh, talking about tattoos and how cool it was, and they were the next generation of voters. And so with that data, he's able to predict and come on board and go um, and uh, you know act like he's taking a tattoo. And before you know it, if the elections, these people are gonna vote for him just because the advantage, they have advantage of access to data um, that their people are using, you know? And um, uh, Dr. Rutenberg talked about location data. Once you have that, you can actually geofence a particular location and know what people are talking about. And politicians would use this data um, to please their masses by not necessarily making changes that people are asking for, uh, but simply to, to get um, their way or the highway. Um, the other thing that I'd want to talk about is cross-border transfer. Um, and I think this has been discussed. Uh, there has been discussions around, you know, ways our data stored, um, and so you'll have maybe organizations, you know, talking to you as a practitioner around, you know, data transfer. Uh, in Kenya, that this is comprehensively regulated, um, and it's important to, you know, inform the data protection commissioner. In uh, Uganda, you need consent. Uh, this is also adequately regulated. Tanzania, not yet. Um, and in Rwanda, uh, there's none. Uh, the currently, regulations are proposed within the bill. Um, and so we really look forward to, you know, um, the, the regulations in, in Rwanda because a lot of, um, if you look at the tech ecosystem, especially now, a lot of tech companies are fast landing in Rwanda to test out the ecosystem and then they scale to the, the other countries within, within the continent. Um, Burundi, um, not comprehensively regulated. And then now we have security and breach of protocol. Um, it is important as uh, Dr. Rutenberg had talked about um, on um, communication on breaches. Um, I think before there was actually no um, requirements in, in the old school days, if files were stolen, um, you simply just keep quiet because it will look bad on the company and any reputational risks. But under data protection laws, it's important that you communicate a breach um, for 72 hours in, in Kenya and several other countries have different you know, timelines on communicating these particular breaches. Um, and so it's important to, to have that within the laws. And this comparison is simply just to help us compare what works um, and what can we learn from already laid out principles you know, under, under data protection. We have in Tanzania, there's only penal offenses under the Cyber Crimes Act, as I had already said. In Rwanda, the draft bill uh, provides that um, you must inform users of breaches and, and remedies. Um, and so it's important what Swivel had done to you know, let people know um, exactly what, um, if there's a breach and if there's no breach in that particular case. Uh, my battery is just about to die down, but I'm going to just talk about um, litigation and what's happening um, around um, you know, the continent. If you are aware, with uh, if you're aware, last year uh, we had a case on Huduma Number, which is the digital identity issue that was happening in Kenya, where government um, was centralizing, you know, uh, data. And as we know, especially in Africa, government is the uh, is the biggest holder of of, of data. Um, and so we had this government trying to centralize. Uh, user data and using it as a prerequisite to um, obtaining government um, services. And so we had this NIMS petition uh, that was brought to, um, to court by Nubian Rights Forum, the Kenyan Human Rights Commission, the Kenyan National Commission of Human Rights, and they sued the government. Um, and so um, the, the point, uh, the, the major concern was on data protection, and they indicated that Kenya had no data protection laws and therefore they should not have centralized um, you know, uh, user data and then introduce a digital identity system. So this case is still, um, there was an appeal um, from what the courts indicated that government should not implement the system without a data protection law. Uh, the government hurriedly implemented the data protection law. Um, and um, what it still did, even though we have a data protection law in Kenya, 
the government is exempt. Most of the government processes are actually exempt from data protection laws um, on the basis of national security. Um, and so um, this is the approach most of the African governments have, have taken. And so we use data protection against the big companies. We see it as something that will protect us from Google and Facebook um, and, any, and TikTok and all these other big companies that are you know, collecting user data. However, um, my argument has been that this, um, these companies are actually not, um, they are not, they, didn't, they don't have an army, they don't hold elections. Um, it's even more risky when government does not protect data protection laws because in Africa, governments are more important and more powerful um, than the tech, the tech companies. I also want to just point out the, uh, the case in Nigeria. Um, there's a, a lawyer in Nigeria called Babalola, um, and so he sued Zoom. Um, on the issues of privacy, indicated that Zoom does not um, actually um, adhere to the Nigerian data protection law, NITA. Um, and also, just recently, I think last week, uh, two weeks ago, they, they sued also TikTok. TikTok is a, a video um, messaging app that is really liked by teenagers. It's run from China, and the question has always been that um, any Chinese tech company has a backdoor to the Chinese Communist Party. And so you're ideally not um, independent as a Chinese company. Uh, and that's the same argument with Huawei and 5G that the US government had, had concerns about. And so we're seeing in Africa, especially in West Africa, you have people who are constantly suing this international organization and uh, these international tech companies, which is important to ensure that consumers are adequately protected. And so I have to, I urge lawyers to understand these issues so that we can engage a little bit more in public interest um, litigation. Um, and so um, those are the trends that we're talking about on, on, on data protection. If you're a practitioner, and maybe there are questions you're asking on what does it mean to practice in the area of uh, data protection, uh, we have, in our experience, we see companies coming in and asking for you know, several documentation. For example, um, they need um, internal policies around data protection. Can you help your client to come up with um, sanctions and remedies for data subjects within the organization? Um, can you have a record of you know, processing activities? Um, if you're hiring, for example, somebody has to sign these clauses on privacy within the organization. Are you able to, um, to do work like that for, for clients? You also need you know, um, a policy on accessing data, you know, whatever, if, if it's the guard who stands outside um, your building are you preparing a contract for them? Because guards now are holding a lot of data. Um, they know who's coming to the building, what's their phone number. Um, and so you need to have every employee um, signing this particular documentation so that you reduce the risks um, within within the company. Um, and so I think uh, it's important to, to know the, um, and to begin to prepare for clientele, uh, especially for those who are representing people you know, across um, the continent. This is, is is very good. And then also you need a policy on retention of personal data. How long do you st um, how do you how long do you keep data? You know, client data even for yourself within the firm. How long are you going to have these things? Do clients sign off on personal data? Um, then what what about you know um, guidelines on data protection by default or by design? If you're building software as a, a an organization. What software are you collecting? If you're representing startups, for example, um, what, what's their privacy policy? What, what's, what information is that app collecting? And so I think as a lawyer, you need to look at the trends and what's happening in this particular area. Sorry, I've taken a lot of time, but thank you very much. Um, I hope that you can visit us soon at the Lawyer's Hub. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda, for your <clears throat> very excellent presentation on jurisdictional issues. Uh, we saw different trends in Africa and comparative analysis on data protection and privacy in Africa. Now I would like to welcome our president of East Africa Law Society, Willy Rubea, to take us through the opportunities for lawyer and corporations in data protection. Willie is also a founding partner of Rubea and Company Advocates in Burundi. He has been the managing partner for over 12 years with significant experience in public private partnerships and concession. Welcome, Willie. Uh, thank you, Aisha, for giving me the floor. Uh, thank you to Dr. Rutenberg and uh, thank you to uh, Linda, who are the preview uh, presenters for their cl clear and uh, very interesting presentation. So uh, 
Mine will be uh, related to opportunities uh, for lawyers uh, uh, to catch up with uh, data protection laws. Um, sorry. I just want to, to open up uh, my presentation. Sorry for the delay. Oops, sorry. Oh. It's down there. I just want to share my screen, sorry. C can you see my screen? Hello? Hello? I, I can't see it. You can see it? You, can you see it? No, no. Yes, I can see it no? now. You can see it now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me start. Okay. Okay. My presentation will be related to opportunities for lawyers and, and uh, corporation. Uh, I will start. I uh, will start with uh, data protection versus legal profession. Data, project, uh, data protection implies, as I said uh, earlier, uh, integrity of data. Lawyers have to play to play a safeguarding role to, pro, uh, to protect sensitive clients' information in accordance with the general data protection. Uh, lawyers are the central key. Lawyers are the central, uh, central key in promoting the law on data protection and privacy. According to Ridwan Oleide in his paper entitled Opportunities for Lawyers in Privacy and Data Protection, Lawyers can play several roles as policy advisor, privacy attorney, legal consultant, legislative tracking, data protection officer, and legal researcher. Uh, as a policy advisor and analyst, analyst Legislative paradigms governing data protection are complex and technical and represent outstanding opportunities for lawyers with good expertise. Technology growth should be uh, cemented by good policies and lawyers can be either involved throughout the drafting process or intervene at the public consultations level. I just want to go qu uh, through quickly Maybe I'll be longer when it will come to questions. Uh, the second role is um, uh, as a privacy attorney. Data protection laws enable data subject to seek remedy either before a regulatory authority or domestic court when they, their rights are violated. Legal cases, situation where by organization are held accountable before national courts can lead to opportunities for collaboration between private lawyers with co-litigation lawyers to smoothly handle the situation. Thirdly, as a legal consulting, the complex requirement of data protection legal framework lead most often to situations whereby companies need to seek advisory services for lawyers for compliance and one hand on one hand but also for competitiveness the lawyer can uh, can play a role for legislative tracking in compliance with the general rules of data protections lawyers are expected to deliver legal opinions with value-added insight which can lead to business improvement for companies. Well, we can also have uh, 
a role as a lawyer, uh, we can be as a data protection officer, as that had been said before. I'm jumping on that because that have been said before. And also, we can get, uh, play a role as a legal researcher and fellow. Lawyers tailored, uh, tailored with the data protection expertise can embrace academic career and co collaborate with the research institutions. Now I want to talk about opportunities for corporations. Uh, to comply with the data, uh, the data protection laws can uh, bring to some benefit to companies as, as uh, to put in place a more effective marketing strategy, a better uh, customer relationship, a push in the right, in the right uh, direction to go beyond compliance and move to, uh, towards perspective of thinking data protection as an opportunity, not as a burden. Enhance uh, business reputation, update your technology, more accurate and secure and organization data. This is uh, bring up uh, a, a good uh, image of the company. And that is uh, really important for the reputation of companies when we are dealing with data when we are collecting and processing them. I'm coming to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. My camera is off, okay. I'm turn, turning Thank back you, to Amy. the moderator. Thank you so much. Thank you, Willie, really, for sharing with us the opportunities uh, for law in data protection and privacy. I would like now to introduce our last speaker, Kenneth Muhangi, who will discuss about cybersecurity and data safety. Kenneth is a partner at KTA Advocates in Kampala, Uganda. He specializes in intellectual property, technology, media, telecommunication, and dispute resolution. In the area of intellectual property and technology, Kenneth is a renowned award-winning author and trainer, and this has cemented his credentials as a specialist in the aforementioned practice area. He has conducted specialized trainings in areas of ICT, such as blockchain technology, digital banking, and data protection, among others. Welcome, Kenneth. The floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. I hope you all can hear me very well. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, for that presentation, and also thank you to the previous presenters. So mine is really to perhaps uh, recap on a few things that were mentioned and then focus on the cybersecurity angle whenever we're looking at data protection. Uh, so I'll start with that. So I'll basically just look at data protection and then data being at the core of the FIR. Uh, I was going to look at the, the, the framework in East Africa, but which Linda succinctly look, uh, looked at already. And then we'll also look at what other jurisdictions are talking about. And then just general advice, which I'll be able to advise on data compliance and the like. So I'll start with this. Um, Yuval is one of my favorite authors. I talk about him every time. So people are usually afraid of change because they fear the unknown. But the single greatest concept of history is that everything changes. So as you can see, really, by the time we're having an East Africa Law Society training or webinar, and we're having it online, uh, just a few months ago, we're having meetings in, uh, in, in hotels, and uh, we had to jump on flights, uh, the last one being Linda's, Linda's uh, event that she organized in February. So in terms of change and all these things that we're using, all these platforms that we're using, the one constant that they have is data. And in the new world, so we're looking at the fourth industrial revolution. Um, for those of you that are listening, I'll just recap for you. The choir has aspects of drones, has aspects of the Internet of Things, have as aspects of data protection and privacy, and uh, artificial intelligence as well. Now, in terms of what, what, uh, how, how does the choir apply to us in the new world? One, uh, what has made us homo sapiens? What has made us human? What has made us human beings? Is what is actually going to make us gods? 
because if we can if i can sit here in kampala uganda and i'm able to talk to willie who is in burundi talk to linda and dr written before I, before I in kenya and you have norma and the rest that are in south africa and other listeners all over the world surely and we uh, going into the realm of gods so in terms of the scenarios we have according to you well he thinks one will either have human godlike powers where we'll be omnipotent and all-knowing or number two we may end up jobless and aimless and that is how we will come into the next revolution so in terms of looking at the four as i said looking at it from the aspect of data so i already mentioned what the four is I, I cannot stress this unequivocally the four is already here not it will come it is here especially during covid we've seen really how important the four has been so why should you care of course we're going to look at aspects of data protection and why you should care about data not only for your organization but also for the lawyers that are listening why you should be a conversant and know about data protection so that you know exactly how to advise your clients so moving on in terms of how we are in the fire our world is completely interconnected in the sense that if, if you're looking at the legal profession when we're in school would you know specialize in either one subject or the other I remember i sucked at math and it was only during university when you know i came into my own and when i started doing law and i realized that most of these subjects are interconnected even now uh, when you look at science with, um, uh, everything is interconnected especially in the fire and it is the responsibility of everyone it's according to david Banson, to ensure that whatever you share in that online world in the world that we now call you know home in the cyberspace it is everyone's job to ensure that you utilize uh, data securely and effectively and you also really take care of your data so i like philosophy um, a lot and there's a french sociologist emily that came that insisted that when you're looking at maps uh that, that basically the, each of us has a history and each of our history is basically uh, is able to let us know who we are and what our place is in the world and it is if you look at maps even without looking at the online space that was still data in the sense that the reason why we're able to traverse the reason why you're able to have colonialists or you're able to have explorers and adventurers was with the presence of maps all that required data now this data is now the one that we have transformed and we're using to be able to eat to, to ease most of the of the of the of the things we do and the way that we do business again the world is interconnected so data came from that uh, physical form in the sense that uh, it stopped or has stopped uh, only existing in libraries where you'd be able to find what happened in the 18th, uh, 17th and, uh, and the centuries before that to where it is now in the sense that you can just Google or, or use any other browser that, uh, that you're comfortable with and you're able to find out anything you'd like to know. So that interconnectedness is also what has helped us to be able to evolve as a species and to reach where we are. With data, we're able to know where we came from and where we're going. So data is at the core of our history, our lives, and in the times to come. And of course, uh, if you're looking at lawyers, we need, to we need to reshape and rethink the way we think about privacy and identity. Um, if, you're, if, if you're looking at the subjects that we're looking at now, for example, we're, we're looking at, uh, at uh, things to do with evolution, things to do with DNA. Um, for those of you that are into science or biology, understand the DNA or, or cells are really uh, are the building blocks of life. Now, when you break that down, all that is still data in the sense that the way that us as human beings were able to comprehend or understand uh, such things like, you know, how is, uh, how is uh, my head composed? How, you know, how can I see the way I see? Or everything else about me. So that has been broken down into data. But again, when you look at that data, especially with what's happening in the field of uh, biology, I mentioned there there is the developments with CRISPR. Um, for those of you, again, that are interested in biology, in gene editing. So all these new developments utilize DNA, utilize data to be able, one, to identify, uh, let's say, strains of disease, and, and then they're able to find ways to be able to combat these. Now, if you look at, at, at also the history of the world, um, there are different proponents as to how the world was created. But if you look at one, one of them, George Lemaitre was in fact actually a devout Catholic. And um, so he was, he, he's, he's basically one of the ones that, 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 that argued about the Big Bang. And again, so if you're looking at, at, at where we started from and where we are going, if you look at things to do with gene editing, and if you can be able to make human beings from a lab, who will own that data? 
So already at least we have a little bit of consensus in regards to uh, lines that we shouldn't cross, you know, should we clone humans or not? But again, if you break that down, who owns that data or who, who, uh, who, will, be, who will be liable in case, uh, let's say there was a, there was a, a hack. Um, so again, if you're looking at other things like insurance companies, uh, employees, um, all the rest, this is all data that is now going to be used, want to make work easier, but may also be misused to, to either uh, uh, one cause uh, distress to a certain uh, uh, sector of the population, or uh, perhaps uh, also be able to commit crime. So, but on the other hand, if you look at the use of data, especially looking at aspects that I'm talking about being gene editing, you see that that particular data or mapping in particular will, will, will help doctors to be able to know for a fact, you know, up to 92%, that a particular medicine will work on someone or not. So all these really, again, I'm just really skimming through this, perhaps in the question and answer, you may be able to ask more, and I'll be happy to go deeper into some of the things that I have mentioned. But as I, I put a quote there by Francis Bacon, in terms of, especially um, that a little philosophy inclines a man's mind towards atheism, but depth in philosophy brings a man's mind about religion. So as we're arguing with these things, we shouldn't look at them independently. The reason why I bring all these things up, even when we're talking about data, is to show you that data has been present from the past to before the past to now and in the future. And the more we keep talking about these things, the more we see the importance of data, perhaps that's how we'll be able to regulate it in a, in a manner that will help us to be able to utilize it more and that will also help us to be able to make the most out of it. Of course, um, if you're looking at, at the cybersecurity aspect, uh, I've, I've, I've identified a few crimes here that involve data. You have identity theft, of course, gambling, money laundering, hacking, network intrusions, email scams. So all these are crimes that most of you, all of you are familiar with, but all of these involve data. I can't think of actually any electronic crime on the moment that does not involve data because as long as you, as long as you have that aspect of electronic crime, then you have personal identifiers, the ones that uh, Dr. Rittenbach talked about and Linda mentioned as well. So all those personal identifiers. In terms of that, you know, how do you then prevent, how do you stop uh, uh, users from, you know, from, uh, from using data for, for ways that it wasn't uh, supposed to be used? Of course, in artificial intelligence, deepfakes are also a really, really big problem. Uh, so deepfakes are really learning, which refers to synthetic media in the sense that people are now using artificial intelligence to be able to create um, either uh, cartoons or memes or images or videos as well and most of these are used in revenge pornography are used in fake news in hoaxes but again most of these images also utilize personal data because these images are mined from particular databases so again when it comes to data like this now here we go of course to uh, to ai liability we had a webinar with people a while ago were talking about should artificial intelligence be liable for what it does. But in this particular instance, with with uh, with with uh, with the data, if a particular AI tool mines data from a particular database or from the cyberspace, whether it's actually with consent or not, again, who owns the data that has been mined? Are there any mechanisms to be able to perhaps uh, uh, limit the type of data that is harvested? Are there any laws that will prevent artificial intelligence from harvesting this data and using it in this way that we have uh, that, that I have mentioned? So this is an example of a deepfake. Um, in the sense here, you have the image on the left is an image of a, of a lady, and then you have another image of another lady on the right. And so, if if uh, if, a, if a particular device or if a particular person wanted to create a new video or an image, they could be able to merge the two and either create a new person or perhaps make these two people do exactly, so maybe make the person on the right do what the person on the left is doing and vice versa. This is what uh, data can do. And of course, uh, uh, Linda mentioned a lot about TikTok. I know that uh, in the US, and no, actually in India, it was, it was banned. And I know that the US and Australia are also looking at banning applications like uh, TikTok that actually collect and use artificial intelligence to create micro videos, again, using data. And of course, that data is used to profile individuals, to profile candidates, to profile voters. And of course, the effects we see and we talk about them all the time. Uh, in Uganda, in particular, so here we're looking at whether governments and courts have made data protection and, uh, and privacy a priority. Of course, as you mentioned, there are few countries that now that have a data protection or comprehensive data protection law and act. 
Uganda being one of them. So I'll say yes, in terms of government policy, Uganda has made it, uh, has uh, made data protection privacy, uh, uh, you know, a very big uh, priority in terms of, uh, of uh, at least on the policy level. So our act mirrors the Data Protection Act in the UK. Um, I won't really go much into it because Linda already gave us you know, a very good um, overview of what the act talks about. I'll only just focus on a few cases where we've been able to discuss data. So one of them is a Sega Winnie versus Opportunity Bank. Although this case talked about image rights, and uh, but there were aspects of uh, the right to privacy or the right to be let alone. So this case was decided before the Data Protection Privacy Act came into law. Our law came into law in February of 2019. And this case was decided, I think, in 20, 2017 or 2016. But even from that time, so that particular right to privacy was guaranteed or was reconfirmed or affirmed as uh, arising from our 1995 constitution. And that was, again, uh, the, the court reconfirmed or confirmed the right to be let alone, the right to privacy. So there are a few other cases that have, that have, uh, that have been adjudicated upon in our courts, especially ones concerning data. One of them is Eunice Rebecca versus MTN. Uh, this is a case that was filed um, a while ago, but was decided just recently, where uh, the defendant had given out call records for the plaintiff. And these were, you know, these were records that were, that were supposed to be used in court proceedings. But eventually, of course, after evidence was adduced, they found out that there wasn't a valid court order and the defendant was actually held liable. So in particular, court held that there was a fiduciary relationship between the defendant and its customer, which may be personal, confidential and private, kept by the company in trust and confidence. So although this particular case you know, did not really go deeper into what a personal identifier is or the rest, We've seen from other cases, and again, from the presentation from my previous colleagues, there's a particular case, I think it's uh, rare versus Germany. It's an EU decision that was talking about how an IP address can be a personal identifier. So in this particular case, although it does not mention it, but we know from, colon, from uh, common parlance and from what we've seen in other jurisdictions that phone numbers, national ID numbers, passport numbers, all from, or are all referred to as personal identifiers. And if you share them without consent, you are liable both civil and criminally. In terms of criminal cases, there's also this case in Uganda, Uganda versus Gasta and Suboga. Uh, again, this was uh, decided before our act came into law, but it looked at sections of our Computer Misuse Act where we're looking at cybersecurity. And here they were talking about that if you, if you access a particular database without authorization from the owner of that database, then you commit an offense. So this, this so these, uh, these unfortunate uh, folks were convicted of offenses under Computer Misuse Act, really reconfirming that our, that our, that our, that, uh, that our governments and our courts really see the importance of cybersecurity, see the need for cybersecurity. And from this case, you see that, the, that, that, that one of the main components, one of the most, sorry, one of the main requirements of cybersecurity is to be able to protect personal data and data from being used or misused. You also have Uganda versus I Ivan Kanchev and others. So in this particular case, again, uh, these this, uh, this, uh, convicts uh, had uh, skimmed, uh, had, had uh, inserted a schema at, uh, at a particular ATM machine belonging to a bank, and they had to steal personal data, which was PIN numbers, info, and other, basically, other personal identifiers from ATM cards. So, you got, so they were convicted, and as you can see, they actually only appealed the conviction, but not the sentence. So again, with these cases, so yeah, actually, those are the, the cases that I was able to, 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 to get and show. So although we don't have that many cases, we, we do have a lot, a lot more people talking about data protection. As you can see, our courts are also recognizing the need before and after we had the Data Protection and Privacy Act. Um, in the EU, of course, uh, this case was, was uh, a point of interest, although it is yet to be concluded, which is the Data Protection Commissioner versus Facebook, Ireland Unlimited. So here they're looking at taking data to a third country or to a country that perhaps does not have adequate data protection uh, laws or data protection uh, mechanisms in place. So we're yet to find out exactly how the EU is going to rule on this particular case if they haven't already. But from what you can see, definitely the transfer of data is also something that is very key and is something that's been discussed. Good, uh, as, uh, a good thing is for most of us, our laws are adequate in the sense that if you transfer data to another country or to another jurisdiction, it must be done or it must be transferred to a jurisdiction that has adequate controls and is able to prevent 
uh, any breaches for or of that particular data. In terms of the legal business in the 4IR, here perhaps you can be able to look at, at uh, opportunities that lawyers can be able to take up. So data or privacy, tech, tech you know, in general, e-commerce are now big, especially during this time of COVID. So one of them, of course, is, is uh, e-commerce. Every e-commerce business deals with data. All of them do, and all of them need to be advised on aspects of data. All of them need a data protection officer as mandated by each law. So these are opportunities for lawyers. Um, of course, you also need to be alert to uncontested spaces, especially when you look at East Africa's unbacked and underbacked populations. FinTech, uh, there are a lot of companies that are coming up to offer micro loans, and most of these are using data to facilitate the loans. Uh, gone are the days when you had to have property to be able to get a mortgage. Now you can have your data, and that will be security because from your data, someone who is giving a loan or a lender is able to be able to ascertain whether you are someone who has you know, a good credit rating or a low credit rating and able to give you money or not. So there are entities like Umba, like Tala, that are, that are doing that and continue to do that. So these are opportunities for lawyers as well to go after these particular clients. And of course, there are also several micro SMEs that now deal with data. Every company now has to work with a website. Again, a reference COVID. If you look at the, the companies that were seen as essential services, uh, most of them had to, had to change their models and to uh, offer their services online. So even the ones that were not categorized as essential have now moved on. And I can't think of any major business that doesn't have a website, who doesn't have a social media page. But all those websites collect data. You send data to these websites. So all of these need advice from lawyers, need advice on cybersecurity, what aspects they look at. Uh, you know, they need advice on aspects of phishing and the like. And then, of course, in terms of policy and legal framework, Linda mentioned how she was critical in trying to push for the Data Protection Act in Kenya. That was the same thing we're trying to do in Uganda. We have a cluster as, you, as a Uganda Law Society and uh, as an ICT cluster, we, we also gave views on, on our Data Protection Act and on, on, on the various laws that govern uh, data protection and cybersecurity in Uganda. So those are also opportunities for lawyers to be able to advise on policy because you can't, you can't uh, operate in a market that doesn't have clarity, especially when, when you have issues of data protection and privacy. And then, of course, uh, in terms of courts as well, there are opportunities for lawyers uh, to, to be amicus, you know, to give opportunity to give uh, uh, professional advice to court whenever they have matters. But well, this is on matters of data protection and privacy. And then, of course, if you look at regional trade uh, within East Africa, advising on issues of IP and competition. So generally, data, as we said, is a driver of economies, is a driver of progress. And as lawyers, we are positioned rightly at the center because without us it doesn't matter whether ai comes and take over ultimately ai still utilizes data and you still need a data protection officer you still need advocates that understand these issues of data are able to adjudicate over them and advise uh, uh the public or courts whenever a matter like that comes up i prepared a video which i'm going to play that just gives you an overview about data protection in uganda so hopefully it plays quickly and then i can be able to conclude just for them So um, the video really just gives you the overview of what, of, uh, of what a data protection act is in Uganda and really for most of the data protection laws in the region. Now, again, uh, moving forward, the other avenues as well, especially uh, within the legal practice, aspects where you'll be able to, to use data and also you know, to be able to advise uh, and, and be relevant in the space, you know, the aspect of the case management system. Most courts in the region are now going digital. They're allowing for electronic filing, electronic service of documents. Again, here, whenever that happens, you have data protection issues because you're dealing with personal identifiers. But number two, you also have cybersecurity issues. What happens in cases where data goes you know, uh, missing? What happens in cases where data is stolen? What happens in cases where the system is hacked? Um, again, uh, data has also been used to bring justice closer to the people. So you have a lot more entities that are giving legal services online. Uh, entities like Barefoot Law in Uganda, uh, there are others in the region which I cannot remember offhead, 
but again, these entities use data to be able one to know what are the biggest concerns that the, 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 the population needs, what legal problems they need and how can we address them. So most of these entities are using or leveraging on technology to break the hindrances also in finance and geography. And of course, when it also comes to electronic evidence, for those of you that are in Uganda, uh, next year I'm certain that one of the biggest issues will be issues of electronic evidence because we're having elections in Uganda and, and uh, according to the roadmap that was released by, by, our, election, by our electoral commission, we'll have a lot more focus on uh, on uh, on uh, on uh, digital, we'll have what we call scientific elections. So after that, when when the election petitions come up, for the lawyers that are listening, are you positioned enough to handle cases where you'll be able to succinctly explain to court and and argue on behalf of your clients of aspects that that that, that concern electronic evidence or digital evidence or data, uh, smart contracts and the rest, all these still require data. But for all of them, data and security at the core or essence of or for all the above. So in terms of staying relevant, my advice or advice is, you know, always, you know, remain forward thinking. Uh, instead of shunning technology, innovate and find new and better ways of making sense of it. Have a culture of innovation. So if you see the organogram, you know, on the side, you know, move from profit to purpose, from hierarchies to networks, from controlling to empowering, from planning to experimentation, but mostly from privacy to transparency. Now, transparency in the sense of how you do your business, but transparency also in the sense that how you keep your data if your data is secure you know show people how is your data kept secure and of course just always constantly innovate and engage um i think yeah this one i already mentioned so this also just really summarizes that if you look at the red ocean strategy uh this is red is uh, for again you'll see where you fall are you competing in the existing market space or are you creating an, an, an uncontested market space data are you, you know, are you focused on beating the competition or are you focused on making the competition irrelevant? Are you focused on exploiting existing demand or are you focused on creating and capturing new demand? Are you making the value cost trade-off or are you breaking the value cost trade-off? And then lastly, are you, al are you aligned or do you align your whole system with a strategy of, of choice of, uh, of, uh, of uh, differentiation or low cost? Or have you aligned your whole system to, pass, to, to, to pursue low cost and to, and to differentiate your practice from other practices? So in terms of whether you should, how, how to remain relevant, as I mentioned, the FOIR has made structured bodies of practice irrelevant, so you need to adapt. And data, as I said, and cybersecurity or technology at the core forefront of that. Anyone can be an expert, but you have to put in the time. You have to put in the hours. And of course, have also honest conversations within yourself and the rest, learn and then learn. So all of which leads to the question, what should we do? So as I said, one of the quotes I gave earlier was for Francis Bacon. Another one is for Albert Camus, who is another philosopher and a proponent of existentialism. I think others are Jean-Paul Sartre, um, uh, Volatile ETC. So most of these say that seeking what is true is not seeking what is desirable. So in this instance, what is true is that the legal profession has changed. Data is at the core of our businesses. Cybersecurity is at the core of our businesses. Gone are the days when you just hire an IT person to be able to handle all these things for you. As lawyers, you must know them yourselves because your clients are going to have these issues in their businesses. So if we don't take this seriously, we may be overtaken by other people who do, or if we want to remain relevant and have these discussions at an international scale or at a global scale, we must be seen to have put in the time, we must be seen to have put in the hours, and we must be seen to know what we're talking about. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ken, for your uh, excellent presentation on security and data safety. And before I move to the Q&A, I would like to thank all our presenters for their excellent uh, presentation. And I would also like to add on our presenters' presentation in relation to, to Tanzania because I think we have uh, learned so much about uh, what is happening in Kenya and Uganda. Although Linda gave a fantastic uh, comparative analysis. I think in Tanzania, there are many gaps still to be closed uh, in relation to emerging issues on data protection. Uh, specifically, the lack of a comprehensive statute has left many gaps in respect of privacy and data protection. For example, 
among the laws uh, discussed by Linda in relation to Tanzania, um, there is no express provision on data ownership and whether individuals whose information has been released have any power over it once it is under the control of third parties. And also there is uh, no provision relating to whether data can be transferred to a destination outside Tanzania with or without consent of the, of the subjects. Neither is it clear if an individual has the right to demand their personal information be deleted from the records of the parties who collected it, even if this was for legitimate reason. Then there's a fact that the legal provisions are embodied in separate instruments, resulting in discrepancies, especially in relation to punishment. For instance, uh, under the Cyber Crimes Act, an offense of interception of a private communication is punishable by a fine of 10 million Tanzanian shillings, close to maybe 4,000 US dollars, or to imprisonment for a term of three years. While under the investigation regulations of 2017, the punishment for the same offense is a fine of 5 million shillings, which is close to 2,000 US dollars, or imprisonment for one year. Also under the Cyber Crimes Act, an order of disclosure of information can be made by a police officer in charge of a police station. While under the investigation regulations of 2017, an order of disclosure of protected information must be made by the inspector, of the, inspector general of the police. So what I think, uh, what is clear for Tanzania is that there's a need of a comprehensive statute on privacy and data protection and I hope that uh, the government can expedite the ongoing efforts at preparing the much anticipated bill on data privacy and protection so that uh, we are not uh, left behind. So now I'll move to the Q&A. On the first round of Q&A, the first question goes to Dr. Rutenberg. Data protection in the mass computing age is really novel, especially in East Africa. African countries have been accused of blindly borrowing laws and regulations from Europe and mechanically applying them without regard to our circumstances. Is there room for the continent and the East African region to develop distinct principles or jurisprudence around data protection unique to a circumstance. What would such principles or jurisprudence look like? Should I repeat for you or you got it? Um, I, I got it. Do you want me to answer that before we go to other questions or are you going to ask several at once? Yeah, just respond to each and then I'll go to the next question. Sure. Um, yeah, I think it's a fair question, um, and uh, well, let me first say that um, we didn't um, we didn't exactly copy paste uh, GDPR into Kenya. We did uh, introduce different aspects of the Senegalese Data Protection Act and also uh, some unique aspects of our own. So I would say uh, it is not um, it's not entirely that we did that. Uh, I do think, however, that there is a lot of room for uh, for some development of more um, localized, contextualized jurisprudence and laws. Um, one of which I think is 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 really apparent is in the area of con of consent. Uh, what consent means to an average European probably means something very different from an average Kenyan or Tanzanian or or any other country. Um, I, I think that uh, I think that definitely research ought to be done into that. Um, some evidence gathered before we, uh, you know, before we um, conclude what it even what some of these terms even mean in in our local context. Unfortunately, um, well, okay, we have two possibilities. We're we're either likely going to start looking when when we see court cases, which is where most of this jurisprudence will, will come out of. Uh, the court cases might look directly to Europe and say what has happened under GDPR, and then we'll just uh, rule similarly under that. Um, it's it's 
possible that they may not, but um, but given the similarities of the laws, and there and there is quite a lot of overlap, a lot of similarity. I think that that's that's more likely to happen, um, which really only leaves uh, academia to, <laughs> although I'm the lone voice of academia here, I believe at the moment, but uh, I would say it's up to us really. Oh, not I'm not the lone voice. Oh, sorry, sorry, Ken. Um, I uh, think. Um, we uh, we in academia have a, a role to play in that absolutely in developing some of the, that that jurisprudence. So, uh, actually, uh, thank you, Aisha. Would you mind if I just added something small to that? Please proceed. No, I, um, as the Dr. Rufenberg said, actually, you wanted to say thank you to him because of Strathmore's uh, Center for IP. I know that uh, them and my students, Isaac. I don't know if you remember Uganda Peace University. Uh, yeah, your students and mine over the years have always, you know, competed over that. So yes, I do agree with him in terms of of uh, of uh, the arts, especially that teach and lecture, to be able to impact or impart most of these into our students so that they're able to compete favorably. That's all. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Doctor. My second question goes to Linda. Uh, East Africa seems to be lagging behind Europe. America and some African countries when it comes to data business. What should be done to ensure we catch up with the world? What role should lawyers play to expedite this? Ms. Aisha, may I please ask that we move on to the next question. Linda is experiencing some technical difficulties. She will log on again shortly. Okay, thank you, Norma. My third question goes to Willie. Are we going to see development uh, and elaborate data protection practice among lawyers? Like we now have arbitration or commercial law practices. What should lawyers do to equip themselves ready for this kind of practice? Uh, thank you so much. I think the lawyers have uh, so, so many opportunities with data protection. Uh, uh, and uh, with uh, th this forum of uh, arbitration forum, I think that's really, really interesting. But lawyers need really to enhance their skills. We need to have people specialized to, to work hard, as said by uh, Kenneth Muhangi. I think we need really to, to go deeper and understand better to be able to, to serve our clients. I think we have a really a very very interesting opportunity with opportunities with the the, the platform arbitral platform. I think we have a, a big role to play. Thank you. Thank you, Rubea. And my last question goes to Kenneth. Security is now emerging as the greatest threat to data. We have seen law firms like Mossack. Poseca hits with Panama Papers, and even lately, the group man share in New York. Law firms are a prize target for hackers because of the sheer amount of data and secrecy they hold. Are law firms and lawyers in East Africa ready for the risks posed by the data breaches in the mass computing age? Okay, uh, thank you very much for that question, Aisha. Uh, well, um, I think as lawyers, as I said before, one of the days when you're practicing law, you just have to understand the foundations of fundamentals of law. I think now it is important for you, one, to understand if you're looking at particular specialty careers, you have to find a way to connect with them, especially to connect with technology, but also to understand uh, how, uh, oh, sorry, to understand your client's businesses. So I'll give you an example, and with this, perhaps I'll be able to answer the question or related to what what uh, what uh, whoever asked had asked in relation to the Panama paper um, if you look at the internet for example if you look at at uh, again so code is the building block of the internet so there was an incident that happened I think in the early 90s where the 911 system in the US crashed and uh, that was because it had taken uh, the maximum number of calls that it could take at the time when they did an audit, they found out that actually it was the coders that had made a mistake and put an upper limit of calls. And when that upper limit reached, of course, uh, the whole system crashed. And if you have a very big uh, system like that, 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 that is important 
for uh, you know for a particular social order to to you know to uh, be able to 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 go on uh, uh, okay then that may be a problem so if you look at that of course i'm sure at the time that the coders did that they did not foresee something like that happening so as a lawyer the reason why i bring that up is it's important one for you now if you have a case like that if someone brought you a case like that you'd have to understand how coding works you'd have to understand you know was there any liability on the side of the coder or on the side of the person that commissioned the code at court secondly Moving, moving on from that, now if you're looking at the other issues in regards to cybersecurity and data protection, you're looking at adequate platforms and adequate security. One of the governing principles of, the, of data protection is that you have to have in place adequate security measures in order for you to be able to, to keep data or, 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 to, you know, or to be able to, to, to uh, transact with data. So as a lawyer, you have to understand this. Now, from your law firm as well, what security platforms are you using? You have platforms that are, can easily be hacked, you know, if you compare them to what other firms are using, would they stand the test of time? So if that, if if the if the answer is no, then you'd be liable the same way as your client. Because how do you advise the client to have appropriate security measures when you yourself do not employ those same measures? So it's important as well to look at it from that angle. Then now concluding at the end again. So when it comes to after the breach has happened, the breach has to be notified. So you can't be able to know that you cannot that you should notify a data protection office officer if you have no idea what data protection is if you have no idea where the data protection office is or if you even have no idea what law governs data protection and privacy so if you see that we've looked at it from the beginning in terms of how has that you know how did the particular platform or device come to be um, how does the platform work in regards to how does it use data and after the breach has happened what do you do so as lawyers we need to be able to we need to know or be appraised or know every step of the way in order for us to act in, so in, in order for us to be able to advise our clients uh, 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 in, a, in a very professional manner and in a way that will not perhaps bring them into further opprobrium. I think I hope that answers the question. Uh, thank you, Kenneth. Now I'll go back to Linda. I see she's back online. Uh, Linda. East Africa seems to be lagging behind Europe, America, and some African countries when it comes to data business. What should be done to ensure we catch up with the world? What role should lawyers play to expedite this? Hmm. Okay. Um, sorry, I dropped off. My uh, my device uh, had no charge, um, so I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, I think the best way to create legal work is to, is to first sensitize i think the public uh, because people don't sue they don't for services when they don't know these services exist and so i think um one of the things that uh, we could do as lawyers and um this also refers to people in maybe civil society and um those who are using um tech platforms to offer legal services I think it's important that we train uh, public, the public, we train HR managers, um, companies, for them to know what is data protection. That would be the first sort of uh, angle to get business in the area of capacity building. Um, and I'd, I'd say this, uh, in my experience, especially at the Lawyers Hub, anytime we convene a discussion around a technology issue, we have people coming up and saying, you know, this is our problem. We also have a similar issue. You know, what do we do? And so they realize that um, they actually are sick and they need a doctor. And I think that would be a good way for lawyers to begin, especially in East Africa. Um, two, um, we need more public interest litigation. Um, the moment we get to court um, and begin to, you know, uh, compel either institutions, governments, individuals to comply with data protection laws where they exist, um, then it means that there will be more discussion around it. Um, and then also there will be more organization looking more organizations looking to comply with data protection principles um the demand right now um around data protection issues is basically from foreign organizations and those who are doing immigration law for example now are uh, trying to help their clients to comply with local laws but then also to comply with their mother countries on what they need around data protection so i think the second thing would be to um you know start caring for the public and going to court to ensure that their rights to privacy are respected. Um, currently, this is being done by non-lawyers, which is unfortunate. So I think we need to, to take up on, on the same issue. 
Uh, the other thing is to deliberately go out and get work um, because if you're in business, um, the first thing if you're doing business modeling is to look at what's the probability of someone giving you work around data protection. Are they local organizations? Are they based abroad? Um, where do they go for trade expos, for example? Are they from Europe? Um, is it a company in California? And if you map out exactly where is the epicenter of data protection issues and privacy, it's California in the US, and then you have um, the EU, and Brussels is the home of you know um, all this legislation. So I think as lawyers um, in business development, we need to look at who are these particular people. Can we bring the work back home? Um, and then hope that you know we we grow our businesses that way. So that's what I would do for me. Thanks. Thank you, Linda. So for round two of our Q and A, I will go through the audience question uh, directed to the panel. So, do you think that with the generalized nature of most legislation, businesses should go beyond compliance approach? towards the risk-based approach to enhance data protection. This is a question from Juanita addressed to our panel. Do you think that with the generalized nature of most legislation, businesses should go beyond compliance approach towards the risk-based approach to enhance data protection. Anybody can can respond to this. Okay, I will uh, and, um, I'll start. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, so um as I was saying, I think I think risk-based is always especially when it comes to data is much is a much better approach in my view. Uh, and I say this again only when it comes to data because data especially when you're dealing with, with the personal data you, you you're basically dealing with gold so I think the issues of compliance so issues of compliance are good but sometimes you find it's either the law is adequate or has not comprehensively dealt with the particular areas or aspects that perhaps would save an organization in case something happened so in my view I think a risk of us temperament uh, that should be employed by businesses when it comes to data is because as I said if you're dealing with personal data the risk is just too high but of course risk as well tempered in the sense that uh, it's also not stifling your business because as we understand although data is a very big issue I think the biggest consideration should be consent so you shouldn't stop uh, let's say people from dealing with data or selling data but uh, I think a risk-based approach in my view, would be recommended as compared to a compliance-based approach. Thank you, Ken. I will go to the second question. How will organizations manage to protect data if they continue to embrace the concept of working from home? One of the biggest challenges being shadow IT and paper-based privacy issues. Um, I, I think How will organizations. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just re come again. Okay. How will organizations manage to protect data as they continue to embrace the concept of working from home? One of the biggest challenges being shadow IT and paper based privacy issues. Um, so I was going to just um, comment, you know, about the question around remote work um, and the issue around remote work for lawyers. Everybody's grappling with it, I think, across the world. Um, the challenge, I think, for us, especially in East Africa, is that this is aggravated by um, the fact that we haven't digitized our practice. Um, and so uh, this, you know, for the judiciaries as well as for law firms. And so we have to walk around with many files and a suitcase to show that you, you are a lawyer for a very long time. Um, and so as people are working from home, I think one of the principles that you, you need to do, especially as a firm, is to first figure out what are the technologies that you, you need to use that would ensure that that sort of replaces the real life sort of interaction. Um, and we have several you know, products in the market that, that could help in that particular case. Um, and you can't use these products if you don't first digitize. And so it's important that um, you know, law firms look at documentation first, digitize them, and then 
use professionals. Um, in the beginning of you know this webinar, you know webinar uh, pandemic, we had people getting hacked a lot on on webinars, and it was especially on Zoom. And I personally um, think that it wasn't because Zoom is really unsafe. A lot of other platforms are very unsafe, um, but it's because we want to do it on our own and we don't want to engage professionals to help us and run us through processes you know um and so a professional will tell you you'd rather do a webinar than do a meeting this is how you need to do and so i think also for lawyers we come from the same school of thought that we can do everything and so you want you have lawyers who are trying to figure out the tech world but then also want to do all these things without any sort of knowledge um on cyber security issues cyber resilience issues um i think that's our major concern so the first thing that lawyers need to admit is that we need cyber security professionals um, within organizations we have in Kenya, for example, uh, the head of IT at Triple Local Advocates um, is actually a, an IT professional. It's not a lawyer. And so the sort of skill they bring on board is unmatched. And so maybe if you're from a small firm, these are things that you may not be able to do. But just having somebody coming on a consulting basis will be help, uh, help you to transition. The other thing I think that um, things need to do, um, law firms need to stop transacting on WhatsApp. We did a survey and we found out that most law firms are actually running their businesses on WhatsApp. So you form a WhatsApp group for your law firm and you say, where's the file? Like, you Tanzania, or say, my file is happy. You know, you share all your file data on WhatsApp, but WhatsApp will say it's it's end-to-end -end encrypted for individuals, but WhatsApp is sharing data. Uh, and now we know what, what's happening across um, you know, Facebook owned products. Um, if you're posting an update, you're told, do you want to post this on Facebook too and Instagram? And so um, your data is actually not safe. So I think law firms need to move from that. You can try other other platforms like Monday.com or just go for G Suite, um, you know, platforms that you know who exactly is handling your data and what you need to do um, when, when there's a breach in that particular case. And the final thing I'd want to say is, I think for a, a breach, as Ken had mentioned, it's not, it's just one person. You're um, as weak as your your employee. If it's one particular person who, you know, um, shares their, um, their laptop, we realized even at some organizations, people are watching movies, you give them a laptop and they are downloading torrents. And those are the stuff that hackers will use to access um, you know, your information. So law firms must also have, and lawyers generally, must have um, internal policies on what you do on your work laptop, how you handle it, what sites you access, um, and then also to just have, you know, virtual private networks that ensure VPNs, that ensure that, you know, um, you're not compromised um, online. And that's what I would say. Thank you, Linda. We have another question from Judith Zebedayo. The absence of data protection law in this cyber era, how can you enforce the data breach that is stored in the, in the cloud? absence of data protection law in this cyber era, how can you enforce a data breach that is stored in the cloud? Um, hi, uh, is there a question to a particular panelist? No, no, no. So anybody can respond. Okay. Um. In perhaps I, I can. Um. In terms of uh, Aisha, is that okay? Yes. Yes. You can respond. Okay. Um. In terms of data kept in the cloud, of course, here the uh, discussions on data kept in the cloud, I can't say there is a conclusive answer, because if you're looking at data in the cloud, you're looking at issues with jurisdiction in the sense that where the servers kept. So again, perhaps this then deals with the cross-border transfer of data. So if you're looking at the cloud, you have to tie it to the server, in the sense that if the server is in a country where there are no adequate data protection laws, and of course you have issues, like in the case I mentioned, and you'd also be in breach of most of the laws that we have spoken about. Um, on the other hand, um, in uh, regards to, again, any suits that, that, that come up as a result of data that has been lost uh, from the cloud, again, Perhaps here you're looking at issues of jurisdiction, issues of where the defendant resides, again, issues of where the server is. Perhaps that can be the guiding principle. I'm not sure if that was the complete question because uh, the line was breaking a little. I wasn't able to hear the last part of the question. 
Yes, that was the complete question. And I have the last question directed to Dr. Isaac. Then I would like to give each presenter one minute to give their final remarks. And then I would invite uh, Huntington to give uh, closing remarks. So this question is directed to Dr. Isaac from Shilinde Swedi. What are the guidelines or checklists that we can use to confirm accuracy of the data collected? Uh, the guidelines for, sorry, finish, say the last thing. What are the guidelines or checklists that we can use to confirm accuracy of the data collected? Hmm. <coughs> um, well, uh, I, I guess I can interpret that, that question two ways. Accuracy of the data collection. Um, is uh, if you remember if you're referring to accuracy of the data itself, uh, that's something that is on the data collector to to confirm, and that's um, you know that's that's through best practices of data collection. If if you were referring to checklists of of, um, <clears throat> of complying with the Data Protection Act or whatever act is in place in your jurisdiction. Um, Apart from going through the entire act, uh, there uh, there really isn't something right now. Uh, I can tell you that we are preparing something, but we haven't yet released it. So um, there there will there would be at some point, but but at the moment um, there is nothing like that, as far as I'm aware of, that some of the other panelists might know. Um, if I may uh, just address one thing that was uh, in the last few questions, um, I think that. Uh, I think that what we we don't do right now is value our security, our IT security people. I think we do that in two ways. First of all, we assume anyone with an IT degree is an expert in cybersecurity, and they're not. Uh, IT is a very big field, and just like law is a big field, and you can be an expert in one area of law, but not others. Um, we I, I urge anyone with uh, data, uh, valuable data, and computer systems, which of course is all of us now, uh, to to hire people who who actually have experience and knowledge of of IT cybersecurity specifically, and if you if you don't do that, you you know, uh, good luck to you when you go to your client and say, well, I hired an IT guy, but uh, we still got hacked and uh, we lost all of our data or we had to pay or whatever. Um, and the last thing on that issue is uh, these are these are really serious problems in some industries specifically. Right now, I'm, I, I like to keep up with the use, news in the U.S. And right now, one of the biggest problems for hospitals is uh, cyber hackers going in and uh, uh, stealing, essentially stealing all of, uh, and holding hostage the data from a hospital. So you you go in, you 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 gain access to all the data, you you encrypt it, and then say to the hospital, "We'll give you the encryption key if you pay us this amount of money." And these are really sensitive and important medical records. So the hospital can't say no; they have to pay, uh, and that and that is uh, an incredibly common thing now. So I think that we are only, it's only a matter of time before similar things like that happen uh, if we don't pay attention to our cybersecurity teams. Um, that was um, yeah. So thanks for that opportunity. Thank you, Doctor. So now I'd like. To give one minute to each presenter to give their final remarks. I can start with uh, Linda. Um, thank you very much. Um, I enjoyed the session and learned a lot as well. Um, and I just want to encourage, um, you know, the lawyers across East Africa. Um, someone once said that to predict the future, you have to create it. Um, and so it will be important for us to, you know, create new ways and um, try to annoy people on certain areas around data protection and see what, how they react and how they bring business to you or uh, to your, you know, to your ecosystem. Um, but then also to, to just encourage the lawyers to, you know, have an attitude of continuing to learn, especially the, um, you know, um, the older generation of lawyers who may be wondering what's happening, like these are really new areas and their niche areas, which we, they're all important for us to learn um, because the clients are, you know, you know, they're quickly evolving and uh, they are demanding of certain uh, skills from lawyers, which if lawyers do not have, 
um, they'll go to that maybe closed, um, you know, group of lawyers who understand these particular issues. So I'd say um, data protection has, um, in privacy in general, has such great opportunity for us because people have gone digital, uh, and the digital move has been accelerated, especially by COVID, um, COVID-19. So I think we need to take advantage of um, of these times, get digital, get learning, um, and also get digital clients who are really, you know, uh, who speak their language in that particular case. Sorry, my double drawing, but thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Uh, President Rubea. Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed this session. Thank you. And uh, the only thing I can say, I, I think lawyers, are, we are on the, at the front line of any pro progress. We have to learn more about our client businesses. It, it seems like um, there are so many uh, progress in technology and uh, we cannot have any secured uh, business without lawyers. We need really to, to build our capacity to learn more, to learn more and uh, to innovate how we are working for, for now. I think that is the time and uh, hopefully it's not too late for us. To, to grab on uh, so many opportunities uh, ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Trubert. Uh, Kenneth? Yes, thank you. I just want to say thank you uh, to you and to the organizers and to the panelists as well. I so really enjoyed the session. So thank you, Willie. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Doctor. And uh, perhaps just in summarizing, it's just, just to really remind, um, especially the lawyers that are attending, you know, in the sense that we are at the cusp of a new revolution, especially when it comes to the legal profession. So uh, we are, for most of us, it's quite distressing when you see other countries, other jurisdictions, the ones that are discussing issues to do with uh, data protection, and issues to do with artificial intelligence and the like. And, uh, East Africa or country or Africa in general is ostracized or you know kept at the back end. But I think for most of that is also our undoing in the sense that we don't want to write, we don't want to contribute towards uh, discussions that you know that will push the legal profession, that will push our jurisdictions. So it's just really just a, a call to to arms, so to speak, for 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 lawyers and for legal practitioners to take the fire seriously, to equip themselves with the skills. And most importantly, for us to be the ones to push and advocate for our government to make these issues uh, at the forefront of policy and of discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Dr. Isaac? I uh, also wish to uh, thank you, the organizers, and to my fellow panelists for a very good discussion. Uh, and then conclude with this. Um, law is a funny thing. Uh, and it's it's amazing that we even have to encourage people to go into ICT law. Um, you know, all of my students are, are uh, I, I get to see all of the students at Strathmore Law for fourth year for ICT law. It's a required course, but by the time they get to it, um, they're so beaten down and, and just bored with law of, you know, very mundane sorts of things. They're not excited about it anymore. But but ICT law to me is the is the most exciting aspect of law that there is. I think it's it's really incredible because we're trying to apply laws that were either drafted decades ago or even yesterday to something that's so totally new and is, has changed overnight sometimes. And and I don't think that we should try to keep up necessarily. We should try to learn how to. Uh, be excited about applying the law to, to an area that's that's just so vibrant. So uh, it's great that we have so many participants in this call, and I encourage all of them to learn more about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Now back to you, Huntington, for the closing remarks. Thank you so much, Aisha, uh, for a well-moderated session. Uh, may I start by thanking our panelists, presenters, Willie, Kenneth, Dr. Rutenberg, and Linda, also for very well researched and resourceful uh, presentation you've given us this evening. I believe each one in the audience has had something to take home today. I also appreciate our members who have been patient through the last two hours and over, keenly listening to the presentations and for being active and asking questions. I just wish to remind you 
that we'll be continuing with these sessions. When is the next week? That's on 16th. We will be discussing digital forensic, and it will be something to build on what we've learned today. Uh, while on 22nd, we will be talking about trans transnational crimes, and they've been alluded to about how uh, the mass computing has made it easy for crimes to be concealed, especially crimes done across borders and over the, the dark web. So we'll be continuing to have this discussion. May I also take this opportunity to thank our sponsors and partners, Attorney General's Africa, for being patient, for being resourceful, and continuing to trust us as a vehicle that should be able to deliver you know, capacity building in East Africa and beyond. And may I wish you good evening, even as we disperse. Thank you. <laughs>